Welcome to the IMWG conference series reporting uh, this time from Stockholm, Sweden. Uh, we are very, very pleased to be here. We have just moments ago finished the IMWG summit uh, over the last two days. Uh, uh, we have uh, had meetings at ASCO uh, a week or so ago and we're heading into EHA. And so what we're going to try to accomplish is to make sense of treatment based upon uh, input from those three uh, venues. And uh, I'm very, very pleased that joining me, uh, uh, Brian Dury here, I have to my immediate left, uh, Joseph McHale uh, from the City of Hope Cancer Center and uh, now the uh, uh, Chief Medical Officer at the International Myeloma Foundation. Very, very pleased to welcome uh, Joe today. Thank you, and uh, very pleased to have Sagar Lonio from Emory, Emory University in Atlanta. Uh, so we have very, very good input to try to make sense of what we're going to talk about today, which are uh, six uh, topics which have been heavily discussed, uh, particularly at our summit, but also uh, at ASCO and uh, coming up at EHA. And so something completely new is the role of uh, mass spectrometry. Uh, so the first thing for a broad audience, and actually, frankly, for most of our IMWG members is, well, what is mass spectrometry? Uh, and so spectrometry in this case based upon the mass or the weight of the proteins and what that means for monoclonal proteins is based upon the weight like lambda and kappa one can distinguish uh, the mass of lambda versus kappa in a very very specific way based upon the the mass or the number of da daltons which is a, an expression of the weight and so uh, using a, a workflow lab this will transform a lab into a mass fix, the fix meaning uh, immunofixation. Instead of using immunofixation, it's going to be possible to use this MALDI mass spec machine. This MALDI is the, is the type of automated machine that will handle uh, the samples coming in, and then there will be a readout that will allow us to see uh, the, the presence or absence of these monoclonal proteins and it will be a whole new reference system for the lab uh, with a different workflow which will be much much more efficient and also much much more reliable and so there is a, a transformation coming to the initial detection of myeloma the monoclonal protein the immunofixation and this is going to have a big impact in the way that we diagnose and follow patients with myeloma and MGUS and smoldering myeloma as well. So just to show you, this is what it will look like. It will be possible to see a, a spike on the mass spec, which is the myeloma monoclonal protein. Separately, we will be able to see treatments which are also proteins, such as daratumumab. And you can see here that if there's daratumumab being given, that you can see as you give the daratumumab uh, that, the, that the myeloma protein is going down. Uh, and a response to, more, to, to daratumumab will be evident in a very precise way. Uh, one can also look at the proteins over time. And what is seen here is when you follow the proteins at a very, very deep level, so if you're looking at the deepening of the response, when you go to a very deep level, there are patients who continue to have absence of the protein even at a deep level. And then when you go deeper, if the protein is present, those are the patients that are liable to relapse early. And so it will transform our ability to understand uh, response and relapse. So this was going to be a, 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 a technology that will really impact uh, the way that we look at patients. And another important aspect shown here is diagnosing MGUS. This is a patient with MGUS in 2006. Back in uh, 1997, there was no immunofixation spike. When the sample was tested with immunofixation, with um, mass spectrometry, it turned out that in fact uh, there was a spike there that was, uh, that was evident back in 1997. And so we are going to be able to diagnose these early disease patients, MGUS, much, much earlier. It's going to understand, uh, allow us to understand uh, the evolution and the biology of these earlier disease states. And so, uh, more sensitivity, a practical commercial method, identification of monoclonal antibodies used for therapy, it will change for sure the diagnosis and response assessment. And so 
uh, Joe, perhaps first you could say, well, wh what, what do you think is going to be the impact of this? Well, thanks, Brian. I mean, you've summarized it so well. I mean, I think for patients listening in today, you know, one of the challenges that we have with myeloma is that although, you know, the immunofixation methods we have now and the serum protein electrophoresis and even the light chains can be quite accurate, they may not be as accurate as we think they are. The, the, between labs, there's differences. I know a lot of patients would come and say, you know, Doc, how is my M spike here 1.3? I just had it done last week at my other yes. doctors at 1.6. So it's really going to, I think, give us a more accurate measure of someone's disease. Remember, myeloma is a protein disease, and so yeah. the best way we can measure a protein will be helpful for them. <clears throat> I think it'll also help in that we'll be able to detect even smaller amounts of the disease coming back, as you've shown, than before. We used to have to wait until it was maybe a bit more crude method. Now we have a much more precise way of doing so. Um, so I think, I think for the patients listening in, I gotta have a better assessment of, of my disease. I gotta have an, a, a better way to pick up my disease when it comes back. Of course, there's all the benefits in the lab. It's gonna happen more quickly, but that also can benefit the patient too. Mm -hmm. Some labs take two, three days to do the seroprotein electrophoresis and, and, and all of the, the ongoing tests with it with mass spec, even though it's gonna take a while for labs to implement this. Once they have it up and running, uh, this can be have a turnaround time easily within the same day. Oh yes, uh, yes. but I think it's not. It's going to take several months, if not years, before this will be available to all the patients listening in today. But yes. in the short term, we're going to start to see it already have an impact. Yes, it's going to be a rollout over the next uh, couple of years or so, where it'll be available um, as a experimental test uh, and then a commercial test, uh, maybe a couple of years from now. So what, what do you think, Saiga? Yeah, I mean, I think it's pretty clear consistency and convenience are two definite advantages of mass spec. Um, I like the idea of being able to know within a Dalton where your protein is yes. and then compare it to others. And I think from a future research perspective, the ability to know what the background other proteins in a patient with MGUS, for instance, as mm -hmm. you showed, may clue us into the risk of progressing to myeloma where you may lose mm -hmm. that background as opposed to a polyclonal spike where you know that that background predicts for perhaps a better outcome. So I think there are lots of opportunities. Yeah, understanding that biology of the evolution of the MGUS, I think that uh, there's a lot that we don't know right mm -hmm. there. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so I think uh, uh, good points. Uh, so we're looking forward to this, uh, and uh, this is the first time that it's really been discussed at any kind of a major meeting, and I think uh, everyone was kind of excited just to, mm -hmm. to to understand the status of this testing. Maybe just one other thing that I'll, yes. uh, that I'll add, Brian, is that as we're incorporating more mass spec testing in the clinical trials that we're doing, in particular, the screening trials, I think, are gonna be important. You know, A number of us are involved in these kinds of studies where we wanna test large populations of patients. Mm -hmm. you know, obviously, here at the IMF, we do this amazing work in Iceland trying to screen huge numbers of patients. Right. That instead of just using the traditional test, now we're adding mass spec to it. That's going to give us a deeper insight to, to better right. uh, understand, as we said, the biology of the mm -hmm. disease and, and the research questions that come from it, but even being able to detect it at lower levels. Um, you know, Absolutely. we had a good discussion here at the summit. Does right. this mean everybody in the world has MGUS now if we look really, right, really right. carefully? Well, no, not everybody in the world has right. MGUS. Right. But the, the incidence of MGUS will likely go up a little bit in the sense right. that, um, not that the incidence itself has changed, but our ability to detect it has changed. Right, and that right. gives us confidence to say we can really know uh, if someone has it or not, because there are Absolutely. examples like the one you gave where someone may have been told, oh, no, you don't have MGUS, nothing to worry about, when in fact the patient might have it. Absolutely. So this will allow us to, to detect that more carefully. Right, well, well in, in reviewing uh, normal uh, uh, people, uh, the, the, the increased occurrence of uh, spikes was only increased one by, and a half or two by one and a half, two percent. So I think that uh, we don't need to be too worried about picking up a lot of extra mm -hmm. spikes. And so when we find an, a spike, it, it probably is going to be meaningful. Right. Uh, and uh, I think that is very exciting in Iceland to understand uh, how many more cases of MGUS might be picked up. And also the age distribution, mm -hmm. uh, when do those uh, spikes occur? And we're interested to learn uh, maybe what's causing those spikes to occur, uh, whether it be uh, in, in the setting of a particular uh, genetic pattern or other environmental or social factors that are contributing to that, and then also uh, an opportunity for early intervention. Yeah, and, and I think, you know, particularly one of the challenges that we, we face now 
is um, the the light chain escape or mm -hmm. the oligosecretory patient. Yes. Using the free light chain assay sometimes give you some clues into how to follow those patients, mm -hmm. but, but this may be a much more precise way to deal with that, uh, which often occurs in later lines of therapy. Absolutely. So this can precisely tell you if a spike is an oligoclonal or right. a little bit of the original M right. spike. Right. So very important. And that may have real implications for some patients who now with the current testing, they may not be eligible for clinical trials or right. we right. may not be accurately follow their disease. If we could right. do it more accurately, uh, that might allow them to, be, to have greater access to other treatments. Absolutely.